Hello, everyone. This is Sandy Lewis, Chair of the Guidelines International Network for North America, and I thank all of you for attending today's webinar. We're fortunate enough to have Anna Gagliardi, who will be presenting Guidelines, Implementation Science, and Where Do We Go From Here? For those of you who were on some of her past webinars, you've heard quite a bit about implementation. Today she's going to take us further than that. She's going to take us beyond the basics. So Anna Gagliardi is a scientist at the Toronto General Hospital Research Institute. She's also Associate Professor at the University of Toronto. Anna's research focuses primarily on guideline implementation and in particular the development and evaluation of guideline implementation tools and how they support decision making, performance improvement, and patient-centered care. She's the chair of the Guidelines International Network's task force or working group called the Implementation Working Group, and she's a member of the GIN North America Steering Committee. We're going to ask that you please um, type any questions that you may have into the chat box, which I believe is located on the lower left side of your screen, and we will be uh, reading your questions to Anna at appropriate points in the webinar or at the end of the webinar because this way we don't have to deal with all the extraneous noise that would happen if we took you off mute. So please be careful to type your question completely and clearly so that I will understand and others will understand what your questions are. And with that, I'm going to turn this over to Anna to present us guidelines, implementation science, and where do we go from here? Anna? Thank you very much, Sandy, for that introduction and for inviting me to give a presentation via this webinar forum. And, and thanks to everyone who has joined. Um, we did a test yesterday, and I was told that my, my audio was not entirely clear. So if any of you are having trouble, uh, then please just, I guess, type that into the chat, and uh, we'll try and uh, adjust. So here you can see the title that Sandy uh, introduced to you and that was circulated to you. Um, I, I propose an alternative title, Please Stop Saying Gap or Chasm, something that I myself am guilty of. Um, I, I just wanted to throw that in here so that you can reflect on that in the back of your mind. And I'm going to return to this idea at towards the end of the uh, presentation. Now, when you search for images to represent gaps, there are a lot of options available. And I chose this one because I thought it was particularly silly. This poor woman here is having quite a time bridging this gap, wearing stiletto heels and a blindfold. But maybe some tips from implementation science can help her out. On that note, uh, you've seen the objective for the presentation. Essentially, we're going to be exploring how implementation science can help us um, plan guideline implementation. And I'm hoping that at the end of the presentation, we'll have some time to raise and discuss some guideline implementation issues to take us forward. This is the requisite definition slide, although sometimes we uh, interchange the terms knowledge translation and implementation science, you can see that the definitions are, are also um, interchangeable. It refer, implementation refers to approaches or strategies for promoting the use of research in practice to improve healthcare delivery and health. We're going to jump right in to uh, one of the polls that are interspersed throughout the presentation. I don't have too many of them. The topic is true or false. Do you believe that currently, current day practice is evidence-based? So we'll give you a moment to uh, find on your screen where and how to do the poll and submit your answer true or false. And Tom is going to, uh, in the background, compile those results and will shortly see the, uh, the findings on slides before we proceed. So well, there we go. Um, almost three quarters of you believe that uh, current day practice is not evidence based. So 
in this slide, I am showing two of many examples of studies that demonstrated that guidelines uh, are not used. Now, these studies both uh, were published in 2004, and I chose these in particular because they were um, quite profound studies, very large studies. Now, you might justifiably argue that sometimes guideline uh, recommendations are not relevant for each and every patient. However, I think we could probably agree that, for example, in the first study, 55% of patients that would have been eligible did not receive guideline recommended care. So I think we would probably agree that that happens to be on the low side. Now that was in 2004. Jump forward to 2012, 2014, 2016. We have many similar examples. And Anna, this is Sandy. I'm going to yeah. jump in here because your audio is kind of um, going going awfully low from time to time. Oh, Maybe you can well, get a little I'm, closer to the microphone or something. Is this better? This is better. Thank you, Anna. That is better. Okay. Yeah. I'm moving. I'm moving the phone closer to me. Okay. So we'll we'll go with that, and and please let me know if that's not working. Sorry for the interruption. So, no problem. Thank you. So in, in this slide, the title suggests that more than ever, implementation science and guideline implementation is a pressing and important issue because we have more and more research for many more conditions and also many more guidelines. Here's another poll for you, true or false? Implementation science processes are well established. Essentially, the question is, do we know how to implement guidelines? It looks like answers are coming in fast and serious. I'm saying mostly no. <laughs> yep, here come the results. All of you that answered said we, we do not really know how to implement guidelines. Um, I would say that we, we know quite a bit about how to implement guidelines, but research shows that guidelines are generally disseminated and not implemented. Now, the implementation working group has developed a number of resources to help guideline developers and others implement guidelines. For example, we conducted a systematic review of existing guideline development and implementation manuals and summarized that in this publication that was published in Implementation Science. And a summary of that information is available on the GIN website. And here I just captured a small picture of it. Now, the rest of the presentation addresses what we do know about how to implement guidelines, and I have structured the presentation according to the knowledge to action cycle. Now, for those of you who aren't familiar with it, I'll just review it briefly. The inner cone represents the synthesis of knowledge into products like guidelines. The outer series of cycles represents um, a series of processes that can be used to implement those syntheses or, or guidelines. And one might do that in two scenarios, after newly developing a guideline or when compliance problems are identified. So we're now going to move around the steps of that cycle. One of the first steps is to adapt knowledge or guidelines to the local context. We actually have quite a few ways uh, that we know about how to do that. So one of them is the ADAPT collaboration that has developed a, uh, a systematic process for taking existing guidelines or newly developed guidelines and adapting them so that they're more suitable to a given context. The agree, grade, and GLIA criteria and principles provide us with numerous ways 
to enhance the format and the content of guidelines so that they are more likely to be used. My research has investigated the idea of guideline implementation tools, meaning resources that can be included in or with guidelines specifically to help users implement the recommendations. Now in this first study, trying to use one of the pointers here. Not working. Um, sorry about that. In the in the topmost study, the BMJ open study, what we found through analysis of 137 guidelines is that most of them did not include implementation advice or guideline implementation tools. And as a result, we have done additional research to develop and test a framework of different types of guideline implementation tools that can be included in guidelines specifically for patients. Here is that uh, framework or, or taxonomy. And each row represents one or more types of guideline implementation tools for patients that could accompany or supplement guidelines. This slide is showing you that we also developed guidance, so a, a series of processes and principles for developing guideline implementation tools. Now we did that through survey of the international guideline community and also interviews with developers of guideline implementation tools from organizations worldwide. Those results are published. And we have also created summaries, which again are available on the GIN website. So we have a summary for uh, the development of guideline implementation tools and also a summary uh, of resources that can be used to develop many different types of guideline implementation tools for patients. Returning back to the knowledge to action cycle, the next step is to assess barriers of guideline use. Here is another poll for you. True or false, awareness of guidelines is the most common barrier. Results seem to be a little more mixed for this one, which is interesting. Still pretty even. So is awareness of guidelines the most common barrier? We're, we're, we're pretty close with yes and no. So awareness of guidelines is definitely one of the barriers. In fact, there are many, many potential barriers of guideline use. I'm showing you here the results of one particular study by Krauss that identified 601 distinct barriers of the use of five different uh, chronic care guidelines in five different European countries. The purpose of their study was not just to identify barriers, they were also trying to learn what is the best way to identify barriers. And they found that brainstorming and interviews with healthcare professionals and with patients identified the most barriers. What was also interesting and notable about this study is that healthcare professionals and patients identified different barriers which suggests that there is a need to consult with different stakeholders. Now, there is a thorough compilation of barriers that was um, compiled and refined by Flotorp and colleagues. They conducted a systematic review, and then they engaged or consulted with international experts in implementation to come up with this framework. I know it's very small. I wanted to give you a sense of what it looked like. It includes 57 different um, determinants or barriers that are organized in seven domains. And I have found this to be a really useful tool for guideline implementation planning because it provides very clear definitions and examples of each barrier 
as well as corresponding interventions or strategies. So if that um, uh, barrier were pertinent, you would have some idea of what type of intervention to use to implement to overcome that particular barrier. Now, in the implementation working group, we've done a systematic review of questionnaires that have been used to assess barriers of guideline use amongst physicians. The systematic review included 178 studies. Each one of those studies used um, a unique questionnaire. However, none of those questionnaires fully assessed the range of barriers that are included in the flow torque framework, which suggests that um, these, these questionnaires, these physician barrier questionnaires, are not really um, uh, providing a good sense of what the barriers are. So the, the use of that information is potentially leading to suboptimal implementation planning and suboptimal guideline implementation which is essentially uh, somewhat of a waste of resources. So in the implementation working group, we are working to generate a, um, a questionnaire that's more comprehensive that can perhaps be widely used to assess areas of guideline use amongst physicians. The next step in guideline implementation planning is to use that information about barriers to select and tailor interventions to implement guidelines. Um, Anna, this is Sandy again. I'm sorry, yeah. but your audio is going in and out quite a bit. Um, hi, dear. I'm, I'm, I'm really not sure what to do about it. I have the phone right in front of me. I'm trying to stay very, very still so that my head and body are not moving away from the phone. I'm, I'm not sure okay. what else to suggest or try. I'm so sorry. That's okay. That's okay. Thank you. So the, the poll was true or false. The most effective strategies are educational strategies or educational interventions. And what's interesting in this poll is we're seeing both true, false, and some people who are unsure. Although many more people seem to be saying that it's not true that educational strategies are the most effective. So largely, um, people are, are leaning away from educational strategies as being effective. So let's see what implementation science tells us. Well, educational strategies are not necessarily the most effective, but they are certainly the most frequently used. The implementation working group did a systematic review of 10 years of guideline implementation studies, which found that the most frequently used interventions were educational meetings, followed by educational material, handouts, for patients or providers. However, there are many more types of interventions to choose from. And in the uh, second image here, I'm showing you the, uh, the title from the ERIC project, which compiles and defines 73 distinct um, types of interventions for us to choose from. Now, in this next slide, what I've summarized is what is known about the effectiveness of a few of the more commonly used strategies or interventions. And you can see that research has found that they have a small um, to moderate and, in fact, inconsistent impact, which is why we need to tailor interventions according to identified barriers to optimize their impact. In the right-hand column, you see that I have uh, collected from research a variety of ways that each of those strategies could be tailored. Now, we know that tailoring is important because a Cochrane, I think it's a Cochrane systematic review, showed us that tailored interventions are more effective than simply disseminating guidelines. So there's no question that we really do need to not only choose an appropriate intervention based on the identification of, uh, of barriers, but we need to use that information to tailor the intervention to um, overcome those barriers. Now, based on identified barriers, 
we can also choose and draw from theories or models to help us further tailor interventions. There's a lot of research that exists on this, not enough time to go through it and to really have a, do a good job of discussing it in this presentation. But I did want to let you know that there's another quick guide available on the GIN website which provides um, compilations of implementation theory, but also some key examples of studies where they did a really good job of showing how they use theory to um, plan and, and implement guidelines. Now there is a, a one last poll in the next slide. I think we don't necessarily need to do it as a poll. I'll just let everyone reflect on this. And the reason is because you've already seen the knowledge to action cycle. And so you've already seen that there are at least two more steps. The cycle is meant to be uh, uh, iterative. And so really, once we've implemented a guideline, there, there are more steps to identify to understand whether that implementation strategy was uh, effective or not. And if not, we essentially are meant to start the cycle um, once more. Oh, all right, here we go. So the next step is to monitor knowledge use. Was the guideline implemented? That brings us to the idea of implementation fidelity. Implementation fidelity tells us whether implementation took place and guidelines were adopted as planned. In this slide, you can see a framework uh, provided by Carol et al. It says that adherence, so adoption of a guideline, is influenced by complexity by differentiation, meaning um, was the entirety of the guideline implemented and adopted or were only parts of it? What was the quality of the implementation strategy used? What was the response of the, the users to that strategy? And what other facilitative um, strategies or tools were used? And I have found this to be a really useful framework, and we used it, for example, to assess uptake or adoption of surgical safety checklists in Canada. So we conducted interviews with nurses, anesthesiologists, and surgeons from across Canada about implementation and adoption of the surgical safety checklist and, and analyzed the findings using that framework. Now we need to assess implementation fidelity because if we don't know whether implementation took place as planned, we cannot really attribute any changes in practice to the intervention, the, the implementation strategy that uh, was used. So that leads us to the idea of um, evaluating outcomes achieved as a result of using the guidelines. Now in this next slide, I'm showing you two publications. It compiled instruments and resources to help you measure implementation outcomes. So we're not uh, going into great detail about what those instruments are, but these publications are useful. And again, we have summarized information in a quick slide that's available on the GIN website. I wanted to return to my uh, uh, earlier slide of the alternative title, Please Stop Saying Gap. I, again, I, I often find that I do that myself. For some reason, it's a handy way of describing the fact that we need to better implement um, and promote the use of guidelines. But I'm hoping that what might have become evident through this uh, presentation is that, in fact, we have a lot of knowledge tools, resources available to us that have been generated through implementation science, such that guideline implementation is no longer a black box. Um, and we actually have a lot of uh, ways, a lot of processes for being, being far more explicit and descriptive of the barriers and of the interventions that are needed to overcome those barriers. Um, I'm uh, not sure where we are in terms of time, but I, I think we definitely have more time to talk about, and certainly um, can answer questions based on anything that I've presented thus far, but I really wanted to uh, also take us forward 
and, and discuss maybe some provocative uh, issues about what's next in terms of guidelines and publications. Before we do that, maybe I should pause here to see if there are any questions that Sandy wants to uh, convey. Well, Anna, we do have uh, quite a bit of time left, so we're, we're yeah. doing fine. And I do want you to spend some time on that, but maybe I'll just throw out a couple of questions that have come in. Um, okay, so do you have examples of successful guideline implementation that you can share? I think you did a little bit of this already since the question came in. But I think one of the, um, the issues that would be most helpful for this audience is where can they find these? So where can they find the guideline right. implementation checklist and the tools? Right. So um, what I would refer you to is some of those quick guides that we have prepared. Um, for example, the one that talks about um, uh, theory and the guideline implementation planning checklist. So those were published in Implementation Science, but the quick guides are available on the GIN website. You have to log in as a member, of course. Go to the um, Implementation Working Group web page. And on that page, there is another link to resources. And on that page, you'll find uh, a link to each of the quick guides that I only briefly referred to in this presentation. And those will provide you with, with examples that we have chosen, that we have selected, because we feel that they're particularly um, useful and provide uh, good examples of successful guideline implementation planning and guideline implementation. Terrific. Thank you, Anna. And can you just address one other question before you go on to the uh, looking toward the future part of your um, presentation? Can I will you, certainly try. Thanks. Can you just help us to understand some examples of low to no cost or very minimal cost implementation techniques? <laughs> <laughs> I'm, I'm just um, I'm laughing to myself as I'm struggling to come up with a, a reasonable answer to that question. Um, I don't know if low or no cost exists. Um, what we do know is that currently most guidelines are disseminated. So most um, guideline developer organizations uh, disseminate their guidelines by posting them on their website, circulating them to their members via um, email, listservs, that kind of thing, and publishing them in a, uh, a relevant disciplinary uh, journal. Some organizations that are maybe larger and have more resources might undertake more complex um, uh, implementation of the guidelines. I know many organizations also develop guideline implementation tools, but anything beyond simple dissemination uh, requires um, knowledge as well as, as resources. And, and resources refers to not just funding, but people to do that work. So the challenge is, and this could be something that we discuss, particularly in relation to this next slide that you see here, who is responsible? Because guideline implementation is not easy, takes time, and as we've seen in this presentation, there's a number of steps required in order to do it well. Um, so I don't have a good answer to that question in terms of low to no cost, because it, it, there is cost in terms of time and people and funding needed to, to do it. I don't think in, in terms of research, and much research exists on costs of different approaches. I know this was something that was mentioned by Jeremy Grimshaw so long ago now. Um, this is when I was doing my PhD thesis, which is many years, <laughs> many years ago now. Um, but no one has really undertaken um, any economic uh, analyses, at least not that I'm, I'm aware of, but really provide us with insight guidance on the cost of different strategies to help us make decisions about which ones we, uh, we might use. So Anna, it sounds like if, um, if we 
take it upon ourselves to advance our guidelines beyond the development stage. And um, there is no point to the development if we don't have implementation. <laughs> then we need to follow with a commitment of resources, both financial and uh, personnel, to make that happen and to make it to be successful. Now, with, within that commitment, there might be a range, but, but there is going to be some level of commitment that will have to be met. Is that pretty much summaring, summarizing? It is, it is a definite conundrum because most guideline developers barely have funding to develop the guidelines, and it, that process relies on a lot of volunteer time from members of those organizations. So they often don't have any funding, really, uh, for implementation. But, um, you know, there's, there's a lifetime of research to be done in terms of examining the economic, uh, the, the different costs of different strategies. But something that I, that I wanted to propose, um, which comes after this slide, where I ask who's responsible for guideline implementation? So we, it's not an easy process, it costs money. Um, we, we already know, I think, that guidelines are not being well implemented, um, and everyone is struggling to do the best that they can to promote their guidelines. Um, but what I'm wondering is, I, I really wanted to float this idea and get some feedback on this, would a centralized agency with uh, knowledgeable and skilled people and resources, would it make sense for such an organization to implement the guidelines that are developed by different organizations? So the development process would still be under the control and managed by different uh, organizations like specialty societies, for example. Would it be feasible, does it make at all sense, or is this a crazy idea, to have a centralized agency that is the hub that specializes in guideline implementation? I'm going to let people think about that and, and chat about some, some thoughts around that. Well, I can comment for you on some of the uh, some of the comments and questions that have been submitted mm -hmm. um, maybe maybe this will help in the meantime thinking of the knowledge required to implement guidelines have you had experiences in bringing guideline developers and implementation scientists together to discuss implementation strategies how would you suggest bringing together these two distinct groups to begin a dialogue about best practices So in I, I in Canada, um, I can I can tell you that um, two years in a row I attempted to, to do that. We invited guideline developers from across Canada to a one-day meeting, and it was um, to some degree an interdisciplinary meeting because the guideline developers represented represented many different types of organizations that developed guidelines on many different topics. We also had uh, implementation scientists um, there. And I was really hoping that by bringing together all these people, we could identify common challenges and, uh, and, and work a little more collaboratively towards furthering uh, the science and the practice of guideline implementation. And so we did that two years in a row. And, and I guess I was a little bit surprised, a little bit disappointed that um, and nothing, no um, sort of substantial continuing effort came out of out of those meetings. And I'm not real entirely clear on on the reasons for that. Maybe uh, guideline developers weren't ready for it. Maybe that didn't make sense to them. Um, I, I'm not entirely sure. But I think that we need to do something. I about guideline implementation together, and, uh, and I think further dialogue is needed. Right. So uh, another um, one of our attendees has mentioned that um, 
well, one of the challenges to implementation is that the guideline development body is mm -hmm. is on one side and in one location, whereas implementation itself is often done in the healthcare setting, which is outside the government development body. And right. so the 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 separation and the disconnect makes it quite a challenge. Right. So um, th this uh, this has been raised um, definitely raised before. Guideline developers, their mandate is to develop guidelines, and then implementation is viewed as something that happens um, in in the healthcare setting. I guess that depends on how we define implementation. So if implementation is the um, active, proactive process of promoting guideline use, um, that may or may not be done by the people in the healthcare setting. And given decades of research, which shows that guidelines are not used, I think we have sufficient evidence that it's not happening. So again, we have this conundrum. And I, I'm not saying. Uh, I have I have no right answer for this problem, but essentially guidelines are not being um, fully implemented by all guideline developers. Maybe some are are doing it, but I think it's a, a struggle, a challenge for most guideline developers. They're not being implemented in the healthcare setting, or at least not implemented well. So the um the other I, the other uh, thought that I have is that maybe our panelists, our guideline panelists, who are in the healthcare settings themselves, m many of them, not all of them, but many of them, should consider it a part of their role. And maybe this should be something that the guideline developing organization should um, consider as part of the sort of job description that they work on implementation strategies in their own setting and then share best practices back with the organization. That's, that's definitely a, a consideration. I'm not sure how the, uh, the volunteer guideline developers uh, would feel about that because um, developing a guideline is quite a, an effort and right. requires quite a bit of time. It would require them to also be experts in implementation, and I'm not sure if that's always the, the case. What you asked about earlier seems to potentially be a more um, promising idea, which is partnership between implementation scientists and guideline developers. We're not hearing you at all now, Anna. Oh. Um, now I do. Now I do. Okay. What I what I said was that what you had mentioned earlier, partnerships between developers and, and patient scientists might be a little bit more promising because otherwise the the guideline developers who are the people from the healthcare setting uh, would would need to contribute even more time beyond just developing the guideline, which itself requires a major right. time, but they'd also need to be knowledgeable in implementation science. So it's been difficult to hear. Your audio is going out almost to zero. But let me go ahead and ask another question that came in. Would sure. a centralized guidelines organization for assigning and supporting guideline implementation be a voluntary effort supported by the entities with an interest in implementation, pooling resources for such an effort, or required? Supported by funders of the healthcare services to measure the impact of their funding. So that's a very interesting question, and you know I was really hoping to have some discussion around that, only because I'm wondering whether this could be the subject of a uh, of a research grant. Um, I think all of those models are worthy of further exploration. So if this is something that guideline developers would like to see. Could a coalition of guideline developers each contribute a small amount to generate the resources that might be required to fund such a centralized uh, agency? Or could guideline developers and others lobby for you know, federal level 
funding for single agency to do that necessary work. So I'd be really, really interested in, in continuing this conversation to explore uh, different models, different options, and examine which one might be the most viable if people feel like the general idea is, uh, is worthy of further examination. So um, that may be the subject of, a, of yet another uh, webinar, but uh, continuing on, there is a question, is there an opportunity to integrate the development and implementation process? In other words, to address implementation in the development stages. So I think that is also an important um, process that can be done at the same time as we examine how else to implement guidelines. That's the idea behind um, principles like agree, wade, clear, is that the guidelines themselves are, are developed in such a way that they're more easily adopted by the users. And that's the entire idea behind the research that I've been in trying to do on guideline implementation uh, tools that could accompany guidelines, again, to support implement their, their implementation and use. So I think those are very important strategies. And in, in fact, we, we don't know a lot about how to optimize the implementation tools that could be included in and with guidelines. What suggestions are there to deal with actual or perceived conflicts of interest? with guideline implementation being considered by some self-serving to professional medical societies? Um, I'm thinking through that question. I'm, I'm not sure I, I fully understand it. I think what they're getting at um, is, that the, um, is that there is a feeling that um, Professional medical societies sometimes create guidelines and then broadening this to implementing guidelines because it serves their own profession. It serves the interests of their own profession. And so they see that as a perceived or potentially actual conflict of interest. So the conflict of interest is with the guideline, not necessarily its implementation, is right? Well, the question is asking about actual or perceived conflict of interest with guideline implementation being self-serving to professional medical societies. I, I, I'm not sure I fully understand what's, what's being addressed here either, but um, you know, there's this intellectual conflict of interest, this concept of intellectual conflict of interest. And so if the guideline developers were um, also implementing their own guidelines. It means they're not considering, I mean, in their healthcare settings, they're implementing their own guidelines. They, they served on that body. It's their medical professional society. Then they're not looking at other existing guidelines by others that potentially could be implemented into that setting for okay. those topics. That's what I'm assuming this is. Intended to so be. the idea is that by focusing effort and resources towards implementing one guideline, we are missing out on implementing other equally or maybe even more important guidelines. Is that the question maybe? Maybe, yes. Yeah. I, I'm not, so I, I understand, I think I understand now and, and that may well be a relevant issue in healthcare in general. There's a lot of I guess what one might call jockeying for very limited resources that uh, that need to be used for a variety of of priorities. So I don't necessarily have a good answer for that, except to say that um, I don't think we need to worry about that because a, a lot of guidelines just aren't implemented. Okay, so that this is perfect. So the next question, the next question is. Is it really clear that guidelines are not being implemented? We know that guideline recommendations have been integrated into clinical decision support tools and have formed the basis of clinical quality performance measures. 
should these mechanisms be leveraged with greater intensity? So um, the, I, I'm sure that, that in, there's many in successful instances of guideline implementation. The literature does include those. For the purpose of this presentation, earlier in the presentation, I included some quite profound examples where they had evaluated on a population level whether uh, patients received guideline recommended care for major conditions and for guidelines where we have very clear recommendations of, of what should be done. Um, and those studies found that, that guidelines weren't used. So admittedly, that, you know, that's a bit of a sweeping statement. I'm sure there's lots of good examples as well. But I, I think we, we, we definitely have an issue and a challenge in terms of implementing all these guidelines that we have us develop. So is, is there a way to validate clinical decision support tools? And if so, how? To validate them. That is an interesting question because and I think there are a lot of decision support tools that are developed not necessarily by researchers, not necessarily even by healthcare systems, but by um, external for-profit organizations. And some of those include guidelines, that they, clinical guidelines that they themselves have developed that aren't necessarily the clinical guidelines developed by um, professional societies. So uh, I myself don't do research on clinical decision support systems, but I would say that's an area that warrants, um, that certainly warrants more research to understand what guidelines are supported in these different clinical decision support systems and um, how can we introduce guidelines using those sorts of systems. That's related to the third point on the slide that, that you see here. So can we develop better guidelines, but can we also develop systems like clinical decision support systems where in which guidelines are embedded or integrated so that in fact they're invisible. People are using them without necessarily having to go out and find them and navigate through the guideline and interpret the recommendations, et cetera. On that note, I just wanted to flip through a couple more slides and, and we can continue our discussion. So this was a, a, an article that was in one of the national Canadian newspapers not too long ago, Google Symptoms Card. So the underlying algorithms in these risk prediction models or, or symptom cards uh, were developed by academics, in this case at Harvard, Mayo Clinic. But increasingly, I think we're seeing a number of decision support tools that are available directly to patients to self-diagnose and self-manage. So what I'm, what I'm wondering and what I pose to this group is, given that that's the case, is the job, the work of guideline development and guideline implementation increasingly being taken over by high-tech companies, what does, that, what does that do for the guideline development community? Are we, being, are we partnering with those organizations to do that? And if not, what should the guideline community do in order to ensure that decision support systems are based on valid guidelines that also support patient engagement and person-centered care, which seems to be the big target of these, of these high tech efforts? Anna? Hopefully you heard that. Yeah, I think I think we missed the last few words, but I think we got the gist of that. Okay, I'm so sorry. I don't know why it's happening. Yeah, it's going in and out. Um, but you did mention partnerships with industry innovators. Can you explain that a bit more? And and if we do have these partnerships, then how can we measure the effects of the guideline implementation on patient care and outcomes? Mm -hmm. Well, I just put back to this slide only because this appears to be, I'm not entirely certain, 
because I just uh, looked at the information that's available in this news item, but this appears to be a partnership between academics and high tech to, um, to develop applications that are useful to patients and, and could potentially be useful for their, for their health care. So I guess I'm wondering, are, is anyone on this webinar involved in such a partnership where they are using their organization's guidelines in partnership with some sort of decision support or application developer to, make, to implement them much more broadly. I guess my fear is that this is all being done by people who are not the developers of guidelines. And we need to make sure that the information that is informing these applications and these decision support tools are based on valid synthesis of evidence, like guidelines. So I think uh, we will have to let the attendees uh, comment to you via email because sure. there's yeah there's a few questions left in the in the hopper here. There's one I'd like to especially uh, mention because it follows up to one of the previous ones, and then we're going to move into the uh, the final slides. But uh, let me let me get to this one. It says validate. We're talking about validation now. Validate if the evidence used is correct. Is it current? Is it comprehensive? Validate if the recommendations are created by valid methods. Support benefit which outweighs harm. Validate if the codes used in the clinical decision support systems match what we want. And validate the clinical decision support. Validating clinical decision support can actually mean many things, all of the above. So do you have any experiences with um, efforts to uh, create or, or develop these clinical decision support systems? And then what was done to in some way validate or assess the effectiveness of these and also the content that goes into these systems? Um, the short answer is essentially no. I don't do research on decision support tools. Uh, so I'm not really able to answer that question. All of those processes that were mentioned in terms of validating correct evidence, et cetera, sound very important. Yeah. I think it is very important. I think implementation has never really been given its due in uh, the guideline development world, except outside, I'm talking about outside in North America, because we have actually devoted quite a bit of attention to it. And the uh, GIN Implementation Working Group, which you have chaired so well and accomplished so much, for which we thank you, and all of us can benefit. Those resources are available on the GIN website. Anna's um, email address was, was just up on the slide, so I think that's great. And now I'm going to um, wrap this up real quickly, if I could, uh, in the remaining few minutes. So this is a GIN North America webinar. We thank you very much for attending. We hope you're participating in other activities by GIN North America. So I'd like to spend just a moment or two going through some of the upcoming opportunities that you have. Please mark your calendars. If you're going to the GIN 2016 conference in Philadelphia, at the end of September, we will have an open meeting of all residents of North America. You do not have to be on the GIN North America listserv. You do not have to be a member of GIN. But if you're attending this conference, please do come to this open meeting and learn more about what we're doing. And also help us by giving us feedback on what you'd like. The other um, conference that I want to especially draw your attention to is the GIN North America EGAPS conference, our third in the series. It will be held March 20th and 21st, 2017, so this coming March, in New York at the New York Academy of Medicine. There will be a lot more information coming in future webinars, in future editions of the GIN North America announcements. But please mark your calendars now from March 20th and 21st so you can attend. Also, we are headed by the GIN North America Steering Group, which Anna, thankfully, is a very active participant on. 
Um, we do, however, have a couple of openings this year, and we have an open call now for applications. If you're interested in applying, there are very few, very minimal requirements. You do have to be a member as an individual of GIN, or your organization needs to have an organizational membership in the International uh, Guidelines International Network Organization. Um, and you need to be willing to commit to, to participating in this um, steering group. We would love to have your applications. They are due by September 7th. And if you have any questions or you want more information, please contact me. My email is on the screen now, ebqconsulting at gmail.com. And there will be information on this in the GIN North America announcements as well. So we thank you again for participating on this webinar. This had a great attendance and a tremendous number of questions. I thought it was fabulous. I'm sure Anna was pleased with the interactions as well. And clearly the audience was very engaged in this topic. If you have additional questions, please email them to either Anna or to me, and I'll forward them to Anna. And um, we can continue the discussion also on the GIN North America LinkedIn site. If you're not already part of that, you can read at the bottom of the announcements how to, how to join and engage in the discussions there. Anna is very active in that discussion group, so that's a good place to participate also. Finally, I want to tell you that the slides and the recording of this webinar will be available at the URL listed on your screen now. So you can make a note of that or go to the main GIN website and navigate to the regional community for North America, and then you can easily find the webinars from there. So thank you all very much. We were thrilled with your participation today. Very pleased to have Anna presenting this. Very interesting discussion, very important topic. And although we spent a lot of time talking about it, we're going to spend a lot more time talking about it in the future. It's a very important uh, area and it needs our attention. Um, personally, I think a lot of the uh, science of guideline development has received a, a great deal of attention and a lot of uh, our community has been involved in it, but not so much with a science of implementation. So Anna has been leading that charge and thankfully uh, doing a phenomenal job of that so we all can learn from her work. So thanks again. And we look forward to speaking with you all on the next webinar, which will not be next month, because on the months that we have GIN conferences, we do not have a webinar. So please join us again in October, and more information will be coming out about that soon. Thank you. <laughs>